Another thing that uh, is being put out constantly, uh, how many of you have heard that the Echinococcus tapeworm is going to kill all of you? And in Idaho, they're saying don't picnic, don't camp on the grass, don't swim or go in the creeks or the lakes, and don't breathe the air. Because <laughs> all of those wolves we brought from Canada were infected with the Echinococcus tapeworm. Well, in 1978, when I was a trapper here in Montana, we were all tested in Lewiston for Echinococcus because it's in raccoons, foxes, and coyotes, clear back then. But somehow they're trying to convince people that we brought it here in these wolves. The thing is, all the wolves that come across the border without passports or without our stamp of approval have no treatment we treated all the wolves that were reintroduced from Canada into Yellowstone and Central Idaho with Dronset, which is a tapeworm treatment. And so actually, the only wolves ever been treated for this thing are the ones we brought. And the bottom line is this, this thing, the intermediate host could be a human, uh, but it's in sheep and goats and horses and caribou and moose and elk and, and all of those species, and the definitive host is canines of which if you do get exposed to it it will probably be from your dog not your not a wild wolf and so i use this one example uh, robert rosh he, he's an expert on kind of caucus and the anti-wolf people on their blogs have been putting out all the scare stuff about this tapeworm and so i looked up what his information said just because they're promoting it, and it, if you if you read, which they apparently haven't, it, everything in it contradicts what they're saying. And his, he's saying basically, if you don't want to get it, don't uh, let your dog lick your face, and, and don't sleep with your dog, and all that good stuff. And where this tapeworm once was sort of significant to humans was the fact that years back when, when the northern people in boreal forest areas in the Scandinavian countries and in Alaska used a lot of sled dogs, they had a lot of dogs. And the dogs did sleep with them. And they killed prey species and gutted them and the dogs ate the guts. And you can see it kept the life cycle going and the dogs were where this, this tapeworm mainly uh, could expose a human. And the bottom line, if you're a biologist nowadays, if you want to avoid this worm, which I feel like I have in the last, if I don't have it, I don't think you're ever going to get it. Uh, don't pick up wolf poop with your bare hands. That's the conclusion. And I don't. And so, um, all of you, I would say, fit into this description. Um, again, it speaks for itself. Wolf viewing in Yellowstone, I'm sure some of you have been there, maybe all of you have been there. Um, it's a huge industry, $35 million a year, according to one economist. And uh, last year, what did we guys say last night? 3.6 million, it was a new record uh, visitor, uh, a new visitor record in Yellowstone. And many of those people come not only to watch the, the geysers and that, they come there to the park Sportsmen say, well, we put all the money into this, uh, so we're concerned about all these wolves eating our deer and elk because we're paying for the hunting licenses. Uh, I've been in groups over there where there's 80 of those spotting scopes, and, and you start looking at the kind they're using. Them things are about two, 3000 bucks a piece. And so the economy is moving along with wolf watching, too. So we threw this in here just to say that uh, that line right now, I'd say, is, is, is a pretty clear-cut line in the sand. Uh, there's them who like them, and there's those who don't. And in the, up until recent times, uh, the animosity has grown, and, and there's, there's people who are just absolutely uh, hold wolves in contempt right now and blame them for all their troubles and, and, and all of the uh, perceived problems with uh, big game management. And of course, there's others from the far left that don't want you to hunt them and trap them and kill them for any reason. And I really believe that's unrealistic too, because I think if you follow the politics, the, the state fish and game agencies are going to go to killing wolves just as quick as they're delisted. Well, you all heard Ed, and there, there's Ed's quote, and I don't disagree with Ed. 
I think it is time to delist them. I think we have connectivity between the, the different populations of wolves. Um, I think we have good genetic diversity because we brought them from two different regions of uh, Alberta and British Columbia. And I really think that uh, 1,700 wolves is getting toward the top of the, of the number of wolves that are going to live in the Northern Rockies. I don't see 2,500 or 3,000 or 5,000, which some people uh, would like to hold out for. Uh, I can't begin to explain to you all of the bills that have been introduced by Congress in the last uh, several months. Uh, you recognize some of the names here, Bacchus, Test, and Reaper out of Montana. And uh, some of these bills have failed, some of them never made it to the floor. And so the bottom line right now, uh, are you all familiar with the fact that wolves could be delisted as soon as tomorrow? Yes. That they're on this continuing resolution and this budget bill. So I'm not gonna belabor that. We can talk about it if you have questions. The governors in all three western states have, have shown they're not uh, real fond of wolves. Uh, Wyoming's never played the game. They've never uh, made an attempt to write a, an acceptable wolf management plan down there. Uh, Governor Otter in Idaho in October this past year uh, just gave the whole thing back to Fish and Wildlife Service, said he was fed up. Uh, he didn't want any more part of wolves until they're delisted. And Governor Otter said, if we get them back, we're going to kill them down to 100 wolves. So I mean, he thinks he's going to play hardball. And then you all know what Governor Schweitzer did a month or so ago, so I won't belabor that. Uh, the bottom line, you know, who's to blame? You know, everybody's blaming Malloy. I think Malloy has made good decisions. I think he's followed the Endangered Species Act and, and ruled the only way he could. Um, we could have delisted wolves, possibly, in, back in 2002, if the state of Wyoming had written an acceptable wolf conservation and management plan. They never have, and they've sued the Fish and Wildlife Service repeatedly. Uh, they've protested wolves. Uh, Idaho and Wyoming both have said, you know, we never wanted them. And they still say, we don't want them. But they've got them. And so the environmental groups have litigated, and I think, uh, you know, I'm not going to say that everything they did is absolutely justifiable, but. I think anybody who looked at the way they were trying to delist them, the first time they didn't have the connect connectivity issue answered, yet went through the database, got that fixed. But then when they tried to delist them again, they tried to delist just Montana and Idaho. And if you read the Endangered Species Act, you can't split a distinct population segment by delisting two states and not the other one. And so uh, Wyoming has been kind of the uh, ball and chain in this whole thing all along. And so now we're waiting. Yes, sir. I didn't mean to interrupt, but isn't that kind of the situation that we're at now with that budget bill as well? If they are delisted, is he, there's still restrictions with the Wyoming separately? If, if I understand it right, and if the newspaper got it right, I mean, I know about as much as you do. Um, if the budget bill passes, it falls back to the 2009 delisting package. And in that package, the service tried to delist Idaho and Montana and not Wyoming. So this budget bill will basically boot Malloy and any federal judge out of any judicial oversight. Isn't that unconstitutional going back to civics class? You well, I think people ought to get on it because... I don't you know how to get over the Yeah, you can't pass a law that can't be challenged by a court. Checks and balances. Well, and there's an article we read today in the, what the Washington Post that said, too, that, that cutting out the judicial system could be unconstitutional. That was by a, a, uh, an attorney, anyway, at a, at a university somewhere. Um, well, Congress does what they do, and, and I don't know. I'm not smart enough to know, but apparently they can use these writers, and they claim that it's been done not this way and not against the Endangered Species Act, but that writers have been a method of getting around obstacles. Um, I'm absolutely opposed to this because you've seen the explanations already in the media. This opens a whole can of worms and 
we read another article today over a lesser prairie chicken somewhere already where somebody's talking about uh, maybe we need to, you know, because they're holding up economic development and, and jobs and that. Um, it could happen with prairie chickens, it could happen with sage grouse, it could happen with salmon. This opens up all kinds of avenues when animals and birds and, and, and threatened and endangered species get in humans' way. Uh, if, if they do this, it just opens Pandora's box to what's going to happen next. Could I get you to clarify your, you said 1,700 wolves, you keep saying, is that the tri-state area or Montana? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, that's the tri-state area. Okay. And what, and what's the margin of error on counting? I mean, there's there's a lot of land back there that's really not accessible. Yeah, um, it's what it, it's. I'll call it a minimum. There could be more, and in some places could be less. But uh, ever since we've reintroduced wolves, they've all been collared, the original ones. And, and one of my jobs and tasks has been to keep putting collars in packs so we can monitor and count them. And so I think the wolf uh, estimate is probably as accurate as anything out there on, on uh, land carnivores in the, in the lower 48. Because we have kept a steady track of these packs. We know where most of the packs live. There are certainly areas in the middle of the uh, Frank Church wilderness that collaring and trapping hasn't gone on. But uh, again, I think we're in the ballpark. Thank you. So in summary, you know, um, wolves aren't as bad as a lot of people feared, and they're not as good as a lot of people hoped. Um, the biggest issue I see is conflict resolution. That's what we're going to be into, is, is how to, to minimize the effect of wolves where they're really a problem. My soapbox, if you decide to purchase my book or go to the library and read it or something, uh, my bone of contention is verification. I still think that if we're going to manage wolves. We need people in the field to document what they're doing. I think Fish and Game needs to do good research to establish the impacts on ungulates. Um, the livestock thing, if you don't have good people verifying and confirming where livestock is killed and where it's not killed by wolves or any other predator, um, with the new, I'll, I'll skip ahead, there, there's a compensation program now by the states actually from John Tester again, they call it the Tester Compensation, whatever. It's a, it's a bill that he got through. Uh, it's provide five million dollars over five years. They, they divvy it up with the states that have wolves. Uh, Idaho or Montana's part of the pie would be about $140,000 annually for each state. Uh, this is for the Great Lakes states too. Um, I used to be an advisor to the committee in Idaho uh, who were paying this compensation money out you know, or deciding who gets it. Uh, as you all know, in 1987, defenders are the ones who started the compensation fund. They stopped paying at the end of 2010. The tester money kicks in now, so it's going to be your federal tax dollars. In Idaho, uh, I call it a kangaroo court. Uh, we sat in again this year and listened. They get all these claims, um, several dozen people send in uh, papers saying I'm out 20 head, I'm out 30 calves, I'm out 5 cows, 6 bulls, 40 sheep, and, and these, the, the committee are 8 county commissioners appointed by the Office of Species Conservation of the Governor's Office, and these fellows sit there based on these claims with no verification whatsoever and they deduct, uh, oh well, they might have killed some with, from poison weeds and, and uh, the annual normal loss would be maybe a cow a year and maybe two calves a year. And so uh, they make these little deductions and then they rubber stamp it and pay these people this money based on nothing more than the papers laying on their desk with no verification. There's so many claims coming in now that uh, this past year is 34 cents on the dollar. It's all anybody received. And the bad part of this is there's people with legitimate losses who should uh, receive full compensation because they actually had a wolf problem. But you have all these other guys claiming money. And so now the claims are, are down to 34 cents on the dollar. 
So I say the guys deserving aren't getting their fair share, and there's a lot of people I think are 